And in 2020, Carl retired from Northwestern Mutual, uh, where he had a successful 15-year career leading technology along with running their innovation programs and investing technology by the means of their $150 million corporate venture fund. Um, but he wasn't done. So he continued to work and is currently the CTO of both Homeshake and Instruction. Ladies and gentlemen, Carl Governor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, indeed, I'm here to tell you a little story about how my journey has been and the reflections that I've had in this startup space. You see, I came from a 21-year career in the Chief Information Office. In other words, that makes me a recovering CIO. Because for all those years, all I had to do was lift a finger and resources that were at my disposal. And what LinkedIn doesn't tell you, I understand the cultural nuances that exist across the American continent. Today, while I am focused as a CTO at Struction, building great software to provide services to our commercial subcontractors, and I'm also the CTO at Homeshake. And if you have a home in Cincinnati and you want to buy or sell those properties, check out Homeshake. They have a great product where you can save a lot of money. But let me ask you a question about perspective. And I'll throw this picture out there for you. And if we had a room full of people, normally I would engage with them and ask them, what do they see? So what do you see out there in the online world? And the answer that I think you're giving me is, well, it's an upside down picture of the world. And my answer to you is that indeed is your reflection and your perception of what you see. But if you really pay attention, there's actually silhouettes of animals and silhouettes of people and other shapes that you see in this picture. But you see, we've all been trained and the mindset that you have is that that's really an upside down world. Well, that it is to you. But what about the people that live in the southern hemisphere? To them... They're on the, on the upside of things because, you see, culture has taught us that the world has a right side up and a right side down. And I'm going to use perspective to help you understand what my journey has been to build world-class engineering teams for startups that have been able to scale. So let's get started. So you as a startup, when we heard some amazing stories today, you as a startup have an idea. And that idea, you see that there's a need in the market, there's customers that want it, you want to build an MVP, and you get started. And how does that journey go? Is it a straight line? Well, no. It's actually a very, very difficult path. A path that has issues with product and marketing and funding, and we've heard stories today about fundraising and other issues that you're going to have to overcome. But that story eventually has an ending. And that ending leads you to an idea, an MVP, a launch, that all of a sudden you start to see traction and product solution fit and eventually product market fit and scale. And we all go through this journey going from friends and family to angel investors, perhaps a seed round, a series A, and eventually get that idea to launch. That looks like a very complicated idea, but indeed, it's the reality. But is it? Isn't the reality more like this? Because who's there to help you? You, have, you, have, you cannot see the future. You cannot see what's going on. And indeed, you're going to have to surround yourself with people and technology, and in particular, engineering resources, in particular for those that are not tech founders, is something that is very difficult to find and very difficult to trust. And I'm here to tell you there's a few myths that you're going to have to overcome to deal with this. The first one being that you need a large team in order to get started. And while indeed, if you want to build a large team, teams of 10,000, 50,000, and 100,000 people for your startup, you're going to have to go to India or China because that's where you have those numbers of people. But typically, you start with one or two really good engineers that are going to help you build that product. And for that, you need quality over quantity. Quality that come with a semantic stack that they understand and they can build. Because you see, there's a lot of technologies out there for you to make decisions on. And if the engineers have an understanding of that semantic stack, you'll be one step ahead. Secondly, another myth that exists out there is the fact that, especially accelerated during this COVID pandemic, is that distance is no longer a problem. 
But you see, even with the ability to work remotely, there are cultural nuances. There are differences between people. And you cannot transmit empathy and feelings and body language and other things through a Zoom call. And so from time to time, you do want to get together. From time to time, you do want to be on a whiteboard. And you try doing that halfway around the world when the time zones are different, when the mindsets are different, when the tone and clarity and perception and eye contact and the way you solve problems and the way you stand are all different halfway across the world. And frankly, it is a heck of a lot easier when you're within the same time zone or at least working in a continent that is three time zones apart. It makes a big difference when you're trying to make a conference call happen. And indeed, you're looking for a common time between 9 in the morning and 6 p.m. as opposed to looking for edges like you do when you're dealing with China, India, Australia, and other countries around the world that have a popularity of being able to find resources. But remember, you only need a few. The other big myth that exists out there is the fact that founders, in particular non-tech founders, get uh, drawn into the illusion that they can do it all. Oh, I'll just download this low-code, no-code thing, and I'll just put a, a, a user interface together, and I'll get my MVP out the door. Indeed, that works probably for the first release of a prototype. But you can time to start scaling. It's going to fall apart. So be careful out there for all you founders. Get yourself the right resources. And those resources leads me to my next myth, which is there's no talent in Latin America. Where do I find them? Well, I did some homework and I found a number of leaders that exist out there that have grown other people in engineering talent, including some friends at Microsoft and, and other people like the president of MIT, the head of SoftBank. And in fact, when I was doing this research, I found out that the top 100 Hispanic leaders was announced for 2020. Two, and this list includes somebody distinguished like yours truly. Very proud to be part of this list. Another thing that you'll find in Latin America are companies and ecosystems, just like here with Centrifuge in Cincinnati. There are a number of companies and ecosystems across the different countries, from Colombia to Chile to Ecuador and Chile. Your normal suspects like Twitter, Google, and others. Evernote has a development center in Chile. Twitter has a development center in Colombia. These ecosystems and, and resources and universities are thriving. And I did even more research to find more companies that you may not have heard of that are growing companies in the tech space right there in those, company, in those countries. Are they below us or above us? So I'm really wrapped up this story by simply telling you that indeed, the story of a startup is one that starts with an idea. But you need to find affordable, experienced, top tech talent in order to keep that journey going and build your digital product, design it, and deliver something that will scale. Indeed, that journey is one where it's fraught with issues. But try to straighten out one of those issues in checking that box by exploring the talent that exists in Latin America. I've been able to do it. I've helped uh, five startups now over the last year and a half build their teams. Two of them right here in Cincinnati. Because in the end, it's all about perspective. And if as a result of this talk, I change your mindset and your mental models and the perceptions you have over where these resources are, it's very simple to change your mind and turn it upside down. Because indeed, when you flip that mindset and look closely at what you see, there's a vast amount of people that are sitting right below us, or is it on top of us? Look me up on LinkedIn, and I'll give you a hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. So I have several questions. That oh, yeah. was, I, I got a lot of insight from that. Okay. Um, I love the conversation about perspective. So I started my journey as an entrepreneur, as a photographer, and I've always been taught that when you're about to take a picture, you have to walk around the subject so you can yep. see it from different um, per positions, so you can know what it's going to look like from different places. Um, so I love that thought of perspective. What has been the biggest challenge for you in sharing your perspective with other people, and is there a way to change people's minds if they don't want to adapt to the possibility that there are dual truths? Yeah, well, it... it it, 
it plays a role in that I do speak Spanish. I grew up in Caracas, and I understand the cultural nuances. But you know, within our American continent, other than language differences, we're very similarly culturally. When you compare that to, and I've traveled to India, I've traveled to China, I've been in Indonesia, Malaysia, looking for resources there at scale, it is a vastly different world and a vastly different uh, set of cultural norms that get in the way of a Zoom call. Whereas within the American continent, we have found that much of those uh, cultural norms, we can adapt to them and we're actually quite similar despite the language difference. Because there's no doubt about it, it is a different language. Yo te puedo hablar en español y tú no me vas a entender, right? I have no idea what I said. Ah, but, but indeed, there's, there are hi highly educated resources with the right tech skills. And let's face it, the world of tech is a world that's in English. And if you study technology and you grow in that world and you are building digital product, the Google manuals, the Amazon manuals, the Azure manuals, they don't come in Spanish. They're all in English. And one last uh, question. As there are many founders and CTOs that are looking for kind of their second act, um, what advice would you have for someone who is kind of re-entering the startup world, maybe coming from corporate America? Uh, if you're coming out of the corporate world, world and getting into the startup space, get used to getting into the details, get used to getting your hand dirty, get used to being scrappy, getting the greedy nails, and, and don't think that things will happen for you automatically, and also um, advance the ball forward and don't sweat the little things. It's just going to happen. Thank you.